Adlib presents Beating Chains, written by Rusty Labuskakni and read by Saul Reichlin. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Adlib. Preface I want you to go back ten years in your life. Where were you ten years ago, and how much have you accomplished in the last decade? That is how much I had taken away from me when I was falsely convicted and sent to maximum security prison in Zimbabwe at a time of great political turbulence. I've always believed in balance in life, especially in nature and God's influence. If we had no rain, we would all shrivel up and die. Too much rain and we would all drown. I had to accept that principle with my experience to get through it. I didn't have any other option. I believe that behind every hardship is an opportunity. My prison experience gave me the chance to get to know hidden attributes about myself and gave me time to consider some fundamental things in life. Locked away from the world I'd known, I learned that the most important things in life cannot be bought, supreme among those being health, loved ones, and friends. But if I had to name a single attribute that got me through my nightmare, no matter how tough circumstances became, it would be never losing hope. Hope is the anchor of your soul. It enables you to see that there is light despite all the darkness. Let your hopes, not your troubles, shape your future, and never look for hope outside of yourself. To find it, you need to look within. Once you learn forgiveness and find gratitude for who you are, what you have, and what you have achieved in life, you will experience the contentment that brings hope. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Ephesians 4.29 The decade of my life spent beating chains taught me many lessons, and I want to share some of them with you now, in the hope that they will help you in your journey through life. Chapter 1 The Gates of Hell Stark naked, I was escorted through massive wooden doors into Kami Maximum Security Exercise Yard. My hands were in cuffs and my feet shackled. Thousands of curious prison eyes followed me, wondering what this white man was doing there, since I was the only one. It was like entering another world. My senses were blasted by the foul smell of leaking sewage pipes and the deafening noise of a thousand prisoners continuously shouting. Over time I would get used to this noise, a rumbling thunder that never went away. Two guards escorted me, one on either side. Staying close to them eased my nervousness as inquisitive prisoners swarmed after us. The four guards in charge of the hall were seated on a steel-framed, wooden-topped bench. The guards made me crouch down, naked and terrified. In front of the curious crowd of a thousand prisoners, they bombarded me with a series of questions. My family, father of two, loving partner, fourth-generation Zimbabwean, where I came from, Bulawayo, my business, safari operator, my crime, murder. Finally, after what seemed forever, they issued me with a standard white short-sleeve shirt and a pair of drawstring white shorts, the only set of clothing allowed. Underwear was forbidden. After six or nine months, they told me I would get a change of clothing. Looking around me, I could see prisoners walking around in tatters. If you were fortunate, they said, a red and white striped jersey, flip-flops or tackies with short white socks brought by visitors would be allowed. I was informed that my prison number was 46303. I was the 463rd prisoner of 2003. During roll call, your number was called, never your name. From that moment, I was just a number, 46303. I think it was then that I realized this was not a nightmare I was going to wake up from 
or a horror movie that was going to end after 90 minutes. My being here was a mistake. I had to believe that logic and the truth and justice would prevail, and I would soon be released with an apology. Had I known it would be ten long years before I would walk free again, I may not have made it through that first horrifying night. Chapter 2 First Night As soon as the guards were finished interrogating me, I was approached by a man named Goodmore, who asked if I remembered him. Thinking that I must have just forgotten his happy, smiling face, I told him that I did, but I had no clue who he was. He was many steps ahead of me. Goodmore was a notorious armed robber. After hearing of this Bulawayo businessman coming in, he was waiting. He led me up to our cell. It was thirteen meters long by three meters wide, with a stainless steel toilet bowl sunk into an open one meter square cement block in one corner. It had four large steel meshed vents on each side, two meters off the stained concrete floor. The walls were covered with chipped maroon paint up to 1.5 meters, then dirty ivory to a ceiling of cobwebbed cement. There was no furniture visible anywhere, no beds, tables, chairs, cupboards, nothing, not even a mirror. I didn't see my face for eight years. Just cold walls, bars, and razor wire with rows of filthy blankets and hundreds of well-used water bottles and water containers on the bare concrete floor. We were 78 in our cell. Chalk marks, 33 centimeters apart, were marked out on the walls. That was your space, and everyone kept to their territorial limits. Image. Being escorted naked into maximum security exercise yard. Image. Sleeping conditions in Kami Maximum. Goodmore showed me where I would be sleeping, right beside him. Then he offered me his better blankets and took the worn-out filthy ones I had been issued. I took a liking to him right away, and we spoke for hours that night. There were others in there that I could tell were decent men. Friendships have always sustained me, and I would make lifelong ones during my time in prison. I would also make some serious enemies. That first night, I learned how the sleeping conditions operated. We lay packed like sardines, all facing the same direction, with legs intertwined in the middle. When we turned over, it was all together. Lying on your back was not only impossible, but also not allowed. Men going to the toilet all night would stand on you continuously. I used two of my paper-thin, lice-ridden blankets as cushioning against the cold concrete floor, then covered myself with the third one. My clothes had to be wrapped around my toothbrush and toothpaste, or they'd get stolen. That was my pillow. I'd always had a fear of going to prison, so this was my worst nightmare come to life. I was sleeping amongst serial killers, hardcore armed robbers, ruthless rapists, as well as innocent good men. We were packed so close together that what someone else exhaled, you inhaled. Not even the breath you took was your own. I thought, could anything be further removed from freedom than this? I had never tried sleeping on a concrete floor before. It was absolute torture in every way, but worse was to come. Because if there is one thing every prisoner has in common, it is the need to use the toilet. The prison was built in the 1950s. Dry earth surrounded the three-story cement block prison in the center of the exercise yard, which was about the size of a football field, and a 20-foot-high white concrete wall enclosed it. There were 12 fiberglass toilets in the common ablutions of the hall, which had long been cemented into concrete blocks to enable prisoners to squat, as is the African culture. Four of them, all on the ground floor, were out of order. Holes were blasted through the back face of each toilet bowl to enable the plumber's spring steel rods to slide down into the pipes during blockages. Every toilet, 
had a jagged tennis ball size hole leading straight into the sewage pipes, allowing the reeking odour to flow freely out. The toilets had to be flushed with buckets. Not a single toilet system worked in any prison I visited in my first eight years, and the dirt floor below was sprayed with excrement from the leaking sewerage pipes running down the walls, leaving permanent putrid puzzles all around the hall. The constant wind would blow the filthy dust all around the yard. The leaking cast-iron pipes had panels cut out of them with cutting torches to clear blockages of days gone by. The panels had long been discarded, and strips of a blanket were used to wrap around the holes that oozed continually and were forever infested with maggots. The unsanitary conditions were unfathomable. To add to this incomprehensible situation, the lice were everywhere, in our blankets, clothes, on the walls, in our hair, everywhere. Some were the size of a pinhead, and others grew up to five millimetres long. They bit you day and night, leaving lumps that turned to weeping blister-like sores that itched for days and often became infected. In the months that followed, no matter how often I arranged to have my blankets and clothes boiled, always for a price, within days the lice would be back. It was constant pain and discomfort, and I think the hardest thing to deal with. Bright lights were left on day and night for security reasons, which was also hard to get used to. The ground and first floor had single and five-man cells, and the top floor sixteen-man cells. Each one was filled way beyond capacity. Single cells had three people each, five-man cells had thirteen people each, and sixteen-man cells had seventy-eight to eighty-two people each. Only the top-floor cells had toilets. All other single- and five-man cells had cut-off plastic containers for ablutions. With a thousand people in this single prison and only eight working communal toilets, the rush for them in the mornings after unlock was a nightmare. Every morning, the plastic containers in the cells were full, and these open containers would splash everywhere in the mad rush to empty them into the toilets, creating a quagmire of human waste all over the floor, which we all had to splash through. Prisoners seemed to lose all self-respect and behave like animals, but maybe it's because we were treated like animals. I would lie there in the evenings and try to find answers for the madness I was caught up in. Image, being questioned naked by guards. Image, killing lice, telling stories, playing dice games, and sleeping. Some of the guys would sleep most of the hours we were locked up, but the majority would be either squeezing lice in their blankets, talking between each other in groups, or playing some dice or card game. I tried reading magazines belonging to the other inmates, but my mind was riveted on finding a way for my release and the turmoil of trying to figure out how I had ended up in this nightmare. Chapter 3 The Good Life Leading up to the millennium, business was booming, and life was full of the joys that love and happiness bring. My safari business was attracting customers, I was flying my own aircraft, and to top it all off, I was madly in love with my beautiful fiance Sue. We were building a life of dreams together. In 1998, I had purchased a 15-bed fishing resort on Lake Kariba and set about rebuilding it. It was situated in the Sinamwanda Bay, behind Christmas and Elephant Islands, east of the Ruzi River and west of Tiger Bay. Few ventured that far from either side of the Great Lake, and the fishing, especially tiger fishing, was exceptional. Over holidays and long weekends, there was always a well-organized trip to one of my safari camps or the fishing resort. The pleasure I received from all the happy people around me was priceless. The Millennium Party was our best ever. A group of my closest friends gathered at Triangle Estates, one of my private safari concessions in the Lofelt part of the country. 
It had a beautiful camp nestled under massive riverine trees on the banks of the Lundi River, overlooking a large permanent pool that was home to several noisy hippos. We invited my sisters, Bev and Lynn, and their families, Sue's family, and other close friends, 28 people in total, from 6 to 63 years old, all staying in my five chalet safari camp, with tents scattered in between. Some were sleeping top to toe, and others on lounge furniture, which created one big happy family atmosphere. We saw in the new year under an enormous baobab tree, measuring 32 metres in circumference. On the Millennium Eve, the 14 staff I had brought for the five-day getaway set everything up in the early afternoon. The evening began with sundowners as we watched a magnificent sunset. With everyone in full party swing, the portable generator over-revved, blowing the music stereo. The sudden silence brought the dancing to a halt, but it ended up being a blessing as the staff took over and provided us with live music, which turned the night into a truly memorable event. At 9pm, I could see that negotiating the drive back to camp in the early hours wasn't going to work, so the men and half the staff piled into the big truck and headed off to camp, stripped all beds of linen and mattresses and returned to the party. Everyone turned in, properly hammered, scattered around the tree at around 4 a.m., only to be woken in typical Scottish style by Stu Gilmore at sunrise for a shot of whiskey each, and the party continued. Early in 2000, Sue and I headed for the USA to market my safari business. As always, the hospitality and our travels with the rich and famous were mind-blowing. I had a chance to introduce Sue to many of my special American friends, allowing her to see how they lived their lives and made their fortunes. In San Francisco, we visited Alcatraz Prison. I remember feeling chills looking at that prison on the top of a hill with steep cliffs all around and no way of escape. It was fascinating to see, although at the time I had no idea the role that prison bars would come to play in my life. The 2000 season proved exceptionally productive. Over the last couple of years, I had purchased two houseboats and a beautiful imported ski boat, which we placed at Nkema Dam, 40 kilometers outside Bulawayo. Almost every Sunday and over many a weekend during summers, a crowd of our mates and those of my son Dusty and daughter Sandy would enjoy water skiing, kneeboarding, and the occasional wild party there. Their mother, Mary, and I had divorced two years before, so the time I had with them was precious. Although I missed seeing them every day, life was simply sublime, and I was the happiest man alive. But all was not well with Zimbabwe. While we were living the good life, the country was placed under siege. After losing a referendum that would have given him dictatorial powers, a furious President Mugabe unleashed his war veterans and the invasion of farms began. The country descended into lawlessness, chaos, and a process of destruction was started which would eventually collapse the economy. 4,000 white farmers, 0.03% of the total population, their families and dependents were evicted from their farms. Many were openly murdered and when seeking refuge at police stations were denied any security. This racially based lawlessness permeated throughout the country in every walk of life, from refusing to pay house rentals to taking over safari concessions while foreign tourists were in camp. The majority of the population was against this anarchy as livelihoods were being destroyed countrywide. The escalating unemployment and food shortages that followed left millions in a desperate predicament. Chapter 4. I Meet My Nemesis On a cool, bright summer's morning, I drove along in my kitted-out new white land cruiser, headed for Binga District Council offices to collect the council CEO, 
chief executive officer, and a surveyor. They had been sent to mark out new residential stands along the picturesque shoreline of Lake Kariba for business enterprises in the Sinamwenda Bay area. The beautiful bay, which was protected from severe weather by Elephant and Christmas Islands, was being polluted and damaged by the Carpenter fishing activity and fishing cooperatives who were setting nets in the delicate breeding grounds of the Sinamwenda River that feed the bay. To clear the bay, all the fishing companies had been allocated new commercial stands at Chibuyu, a village site seven kilometers east of the bay. My fishing resort was the only enterprise designated to remain, as we weren't fishing for commercial consumption. The 400-kilometer drive from Bulawayo to Binga was a hot one. That day, 24th November 2000, the temperatures remained in the 40 degrees Celsius range. The council executive staff was happy to see me, and we wasted little time leaving Binga, and after a bumpy, dusty three-hour dirt road drive, we arrived, sweaty and tired. The resort felt like heaven. Shady green palm trees, lush lawns, and a sparkling pool with a cool breeze off the lake. I sat down with the councillors and my manager, Ian Borrell, and covered my future plans in depth. The CEO was totally supportive. We agreed it was imperative I help them protect the bay from poaching with nets by individuals from the nearby fishing cooperatives. Doing that would go a long way to halting contamination by the growing commercialization of the industry. Early the next morning, the three of us took a slow cruise up the winding river through the natural fish breeding grounds where the illegal netting was rampant. We crossed several nets spread right across the river found smoking fires used to smoke fish and disturbed active poachers who fled on hearing the noise of our boat motor. The CEO announced he intended on reporting his findings and would push for some response from national parks and law enforcement immediately. The previous resort owner had had endless problems with one particular poacher, nicknamed Meki. Despite having been convicted several times for fish poaching in the bay, he was still continually active in the vital breeding grounds. Cleverly, he would set his nets below the surface, making them very hard to spot. I had never met him, but the following day, Mike Taylor, an employee of a Carpenter fishing company in the bay, pointed Mekki out to me while he was marking the residential stands. At the time, he was assisting in clearing bushes for better visibility while the surveyor marked the boundary lines. I politely introduced myself to him and laughingly mentioned that I believed he was the king of poaching in the area. Tall, thin and in his thirties, Mekki had an unruly mop of hair and scraggly beard. With a smile and relaxed body language, he denied that but asked me for a job. I said I would employ him when we started building on the stands. I had a policy, whenever taking on a new safari area, to employ the most notorious poachers. That way we could work together. There wouldn't be any more poaching, and they knew the areas far better than we did. It worked every time. I pointed Mekki out to the CEO, but he knew of him already. He was given a strong warning that if poaching continued in the bay, all netting permits would be withdrawn. The CEO and I spoke at length again that night about plans to protect the bay, and all looked set. Ian and his wife, Pat, drove the CEO and surveyor back to Binga on the morning of the 26th, while I awaited a group of friends who were due to arrive that evening. I had planned to meet them at 4 p.m., at Chibuyu Fishing Resort, seven kilometers from my resort on a torturous road, as they did not know the directions from there. On the way to Chibuyu, I came across Meki walking in the same direction and offered him a lift. He was carrying a large polystyrene sack of dacha, marijuana, and offered me some. I declined the offer. We remained silent until he asked to be dropped on a well-worn footpath leading to his fishing village, which was a collection of shanties. 
After we said our goodbyes, he came to my car window, told me not to mention the Dacha, and informed me, quite bluntly, that he wanted my fishing resort. A little surprised, I assured him I would not say anything about his Dacha and that my resort was not for sale. With real menace in his eyes, he looked at me squarely and said, If you tell anyone, I'll kill you. Then he turned and walked away. I drove off, thinking to myself that this guy was almost certainly high and was probably just throwing his weight around. He did not intimidate me physically at all, but as I drove it occurred to me that with the country being so dangerously, politically and racially charged, Meki might indeed become a problem for me. My mates arrived an hour late, full of high spirits, in three vehicles. My ever-happy uncle, Lynn Stanton, his gentle giant brother Charlie, and Charlie's son Matt were in one twin cab. Matt was quietly spoken and a pleasure to be around. Sue's dad, Steve Smith and Richie Barnes, travelled with Wayne Brebner, Brebs. Steve and Richie were both in their fifties and loved fishing and the outdoors. Last was my childhood mate, Gary Kuhn. He was tall and slim, a heavy smoker and fishing mad. He came in a cruiser with Spike Clarsen. Spike is good-looking with incredibly beautiful eyes and being a smoker, a distinct raspy voice. He was quite a bit shorter than me, slim with broad shoulders and short brown hair. Spike's dad, Chris, and my dad had been great friends from before our birth. Having a passion for the bush, Chris had visited me regularly over the years and always brought young Spike along. The bush and way of life crept into Spike's blood, and after he completed school, his father, Chris, asked if Spike could work for me. Despite me being fifteen years older than him, we became very close and shared terrific times in the bush. Always calm and collected, Spike had a wicked sense of humour and was as loyal as one could get. Our times together were sublime and he became an exceptional guide. The road being so terrible, we arrived in camp after dark to a much appreciated plough disc braai that was consumed in the traditional way. Sitting in a circle around the plough disc and eating with our hands, along with several beers and sadza, cooked maize meal, a staple food in Zimbabwe. We were all up at 4.30 a.m. for coffee and toast around the campfire before we hit the glassy water. The three Stantons were in one boat, Steve, Richie and Spike in another, and Brebs and Gary with me in mine. Bream fishing, which the Stantons were always keen on, was a bit slow, but the tiger fish were going crazy, leaving the water boiling as they snapped at the surface. Often all three on a boat were locked in action at the same time, but it was tiring stuff, with only one in five strikes ending in a successful catch. The tigers would hit our spinners with tremendous force, strip lion off at adrenaline pumping speed, break the surface, thrashing like crazy, and shake the hook out with incredible power. The strike had to be fast and hard, otherwise they were gone. It was a fisherman's dream day. Late that evening, while moving to a new fishing spot, I spotted two men in a boat about two hundred meters away. On approaching, I noticed one was Mecky, standing shirtless with a paddle in hand, his friend seated at the opposite end. I would learn that the friend was called Wilson, and that name would come to haunt me. Their boat was approximately 2.5 metres by 1.5 metres, and rectangular in shape, made of 3 millimetre steel plate. It had boxed-in buoyancy tanks at each end, which were used as seats, and had unfinished rough edges and sharp corners. These details would become critically relevant later on. They had no nets or fish with them, and had obviously just arrived to check their hidden nets, as they seemed quite unperturbed. Meki and I spoke pleasantly, at first, in English, about employment and his illegal netting presence in the bay. He protested that there were no fish in the lake, only in the river. Irascible, as at our previous meeting, he went on the attack, 
If you can fish here, so can I, he barked. Not wanting an altercation, I calmly explained that only fishing with nets was prohibited in the bay, and that we were not using nets. I told him I was going to report him to the councillor in the area, as he was obviously netting and breaking the law again. Angrily, he retorted that he had been in this area many years, and I was a recent arrival. He reminded me that I did not own the lake, and reiterated his intention to fish anywhere he wanted to. I decided to leave him be, and we headed back to camp. Meki and Wilson were part of the fishing cooperative that had grown from a few families to over 80 adults mostly men trying to eke out a living to feed their families inland. Living in rusted old corrugated iron structures with no ablutions in unrelenting hot temperatures was in stark contrast to the luxurious fishing resort I had constructed only a relatively short distance away. It doesn't make poaching acceptable by any means, but they had over-netted the area outside the Sinamwenda Bay and were now destroying the fish breeding grounds in desperation. I had worked tirelessly for my success and was enjoying the fruits of that success, but I did consider how different our lives were in comparison. Chapter 5 The Incident the following morning, the happy fishermen nailed the fiery tigers again, leaving them all sunburnt and tired. While they fished, I went inland to find the councillor responsible for the area to report the confrontation with Meki and to request help from the authorities. While I was away, the Stantons baited a spot at the entrance to the river for Bream. Later in the afternoon, with Tiger off the bite, we all decided to join them. Before doing so, I took a slow cruise sightseeing up the river as far as a boat would go, followed by Steve and his crew. No nets were visible, but fresh fish scales, extinguished fires, and footprints were everywhere. We all took an enjoyable walk amongst the last pools among the boulders in the river before returning to try for bream. The bream weren't active and Spike and I soon became bored. We took my boat to try and get some tiger action going again on the open waters of the bay. As we entered the main river at full throttle, my cap blew off my head. I slowed, swung the boat around, and went to retrieve it. As we approached, Spike lunged for it, but the cap sank too fast to the bottom of the river, so we continued on our way. After about an hour, we decided to make our way back, stopping intermittently at our favourite spots as we went. At one point, while tied to a dead tree sticking out the water, we spotted Meki and his friend Wilson, about 200 metres away, coming towards us. When they saw our boat, they began paddling hastily towards the shore. It was apparent he was back, rechecking his illegal nets. I asked Spike to untie us, and as he did so, he noticed a net about a metre under the water. I helped him cut the net, and we set off towards their boat. They saw us advancing, and immediately increased their paddling to get away from us. I was in no mood to arrest anyone, and grind out the four bumpy hours to Binga police station and four hours back. Besides, the councillor had assured me the day before that he was reporting Meki to the council officials and national parks. My boat stood higher in the water than theirs, so on approach I slowed to a fast drift about two metres away. The wave turbulence caused by our boat and engine tilted their boat and added to their panic. They both almost simultaneously lost their balance and jumped out into the water, which appeared to be about one and a half metres deep. I was satisfied I had created the shock effect I hoped for, and was not sorry to see them scrambling for the shore three metres away. There are plenty of crocs in that bay, which added to their anxiousness. Meki jumped out closer to the bank, and was soon able to stand and make his way out, continuing until he had disappeared into a thicket near the shore. As our boat continued past theirs, a movement to my left caught my eye. 
At first it looked like a massive catfish darting to the surface, but it was Wilson who broke the surface, took a gasping breath, and then was gone again. Moments later, he burst out closer to the shore, and after two more attempts, he was able to stand and get his breath back. I had, by this time, turned our boat to move closer to him, and we were preparing to help him. Coughing and spluttering a bit, he made his way to the shore and walked off into the bush, in the same direction Mecky had gone. It was apparent that he had panicked and lost his footing. Whether there was a steep shelf below or not, I couldn't tell. We checked their boat, which was empty, apart from a short homemade knife with a handle wrapped in tire tube. Leaving the boat floating a few meters from the bank, we returned to our fishing party about a hundred and fifty meters away around a bend in the river. We told them about our little escapade and that we did not think Mecky would be setting nets again while we were there. They said they had heard our boat and wondered what we had gone back for. The fishing was still quiet, so we chatted and soaked up the sunset on a perfect evening. Keeping to our schedule, we all left for camp and prepared for a prearranged braai on a sandy beach across the bay about 200 meters from where Mecky and Wilson had abandoned their boat. Before dark, we boarded a large raft with the chef and two waiters, smartly dressed in their tuxedos, and headed for the beach. The beach braai was fantastic, as always, with comfortable camp chairs in a semicircle around a blazing fire, a table covered with a starched white tablecloth, ice and glasses beside the cooler boxes we were enjoying every moment. By 10 p.m., content, sunburnt and tired, we were all down, ready for an early morning start. Fishing was excellent again the following morning, each boat landing several tiger fish. Later, passing Mecky's boat, we noticed it was tied to a stump on the opposite bank to where we had last seen him and Wilson run off. In the boat was a net which wasn't there the evening before. We remarked that they must have returned to the boat after we had left. A delicious full English breakfast awaited us at camp. While eating, a message arrived from Mike Shaw's Carpenter Fishing Company next door to say that I was wanted there. I wasted little time, soon arriving at the thatched double-story house from which his business was run. I was surprised to see about nine men standing around the entrance to the property, all carrying either a homemade axe or a small club, and they appeared to be in a belligerent mood. At the time, farmers were being violently attacked by mobs and driven from their homes. While I was alarmed, I did not let them think I was afraid in any way. Holding my head high, I walked right through the middle of them and proceeded to the house. Mike was waiting for me. Short, pot-bellied, and a recovering alcoholic, he had an unsteady hand and seemed to lack confidence. "'Morning, Rusty,' he said, puffing on a cigarette. He was dressed in faded blue boxer shorts and sandals, no shirt. "'How's it, Mike? What's going on out there?' I asked. "'Mekki says you drowned his friend yesterday evening.' He looked anxious. "'Ah, no, Mike. Just call the police, bud. I don't need this trouble.' Mike told me he had tried the night before to get hold of the lake captain to get a message to the cops but their radios were off. I asked what time they had reported the drowning. Mickey arrived here at about 7 p.m. last night, maybe a bit later. It had just got dark. He told me you drowned Wilson Mudimba. I asked him if he saw you drown him, and he said no, but he knows that you drowned him. I asked if he had checked to see if Wilson wasn't at his house. He said he'd go and check, and he left. About an hour later, he returned with Makore and Samuel and told me that Wilson wasn't home and that you'd drowned him. By that time, Lake Safety's radios were off. They said they'd come back today and I must radio for them. When they arrived this morning, Makore said that he had been a policeman once and wanted to carry out his investigations before I called the police. They wanted to talk to you before investigating. Mike explained all of this with apparent concern. I went off to hear what they had to say. 
In days gone by, Makore had worked for both the fishing companies and me as a night watchman against Zambian boat thieves. Mike had fired him about a month earlier for habitually sleeping on duty. I had bought one of the neighboring Carpenter companies with Mike the year before. The deal was Mike took the fishing licenses and I remained with the assets, the property and buildings. Makore had been residing in one of the buildings during his employment with my camp staff for a brief period. As I approached the mob, Makore stepped forward to confront me, closely followed by the rest. Morning, Makore. What's going on? I asked. Meki said you drowned Wilson Mudimba yesterday afternoon. But before we call the police, I want to go and do my investigations, he said in English. He looked down at his feet the whole time he spoke to me. I told him to go ahead and that I would be at my place during lunch if he needed me. As I walked past the mob, they all turned to follow Makore and me. After about ten paces, with everyone now chattering excitedly behind me, Makore took me gently by the forearm and indicated for me to slow down. When we were three or four meters behind the rest, he addressed me quietly. Your stuff stole my pots and a pan when I was working for you. I was taken aback. Makore, what pots and pan are you talking about? After I was fired, I went home and left all my belongings in your building with your stuff. When I returned last week, there were two pots and a pan missing, he moaned. Irritated at being challenged with something so trivial when I had just been accused of drowning someone, I was in no mood for compromise or compassion. Well, Makore, I said, you say you were part of the police constabulary? You must carry out your investigations on my staff. I can't just buy you pots and a pan because you say my staff stole them. He did not like what I said. Oh, so you don't want to help me? Okay, I'll carry out my investigations on Wilson. Then we'll see. His mouth had turned into a snarl and his eyes narrowed but I was in no mood to back down. Go ahead, Makore, do what you want, I said, and made my way back to camp. Everyone wanted to know what was going on, and I told them I was being accused of drowning someone by Meki the poacher. Ah, no, here we go, Breb said. These guys want you out of here, and they want this camp, Russ. They'll hound you until you leave or they'll burn this place down if you continue this anti-poaching pressure. That's what it's all about, I'm telling you. Let's go fishing, Rusty, said Uncle Lin. Let them do what they want. Has Mike contacted the cops yet? I told them about Makore, who used to be a cop. He's doing his investigations first. When they are done, Mike will radio the cops and tell them what these guys find. Putting his hand on my shoulder as we made our way towards our tackle, Breb said, Don't worry about it, my mate. Let's go catch a fish. At the time, I believed it could be that easy. We had a superb morning's fishing, but upon returning to camp, we found Makore waiting with three others. He walked up to within twenty paces of us, held up a broken paddle in one hand, and gesticulating wildly shouted, You killed him with this! We found blood on a tree in the water. I'm calling the police. Go, I'll be waiting here, I answered. And they walked off. We had lunch around the pool, tried to enjoy ourselves, and had a few drinks before jumping in the boats and heading out to fish some more. At about 4 p.m. that day, the 29th of November, Mike Shaw and Mike Taylor drove up to inform us that the police had arrived. We arrived at Mike's house to find three of them in a Land Rover Defender. Surprisingly, they had an aluminium body box with them. After introductions, we left for the scene of the accident. Gary, Brebs, Spike, two police officers and me in my boat. One other policeman and seven of the mob followed in another boat with Mike. The incident took place approximately one kilometre from camp and the scene of the supposed crime was visible from it. On arriving, we all disembarked on the far shore near the scene. Meki stood near the water's edge with his supporters behind him. Facing the rest of us, he told us his version of the story in Shona. Wilson and I were paddling out of the river 
when Russell drove across from that side straight into our boat at high speed. He pointed to the far side where we were when we spotted them and close to the shoreline next to him where the incident took place. We were knocked out of our boat into the water but managed to swim to their boat and take hold of their boat rail. Russell and his friends then began assaulting Wilson and me with their fists, forcing us to let go and swim for the shore. They drove away in their boat, but turned back to help Wilson when they saw he wasn't swimming well. When they approached Wilson, he went underwater and was never seen again. Makore then stepped forward, lifted the broken paddle above his head and said in Shona, and they beat him with this. There is blood on a tree over there. He then pointed to a line of dry, dead leaves protruding out of the water across the bay. Spike, being fluent in Shona, asked Makore which tree out of approximately thirty had blood on it. Pointing across the bay, Makore said, One of those trees, there was blood on one of them this morning. Spike listened carefully, then asked Makore, but why would Wilson swim all the way across the bay instead of swimming a few meters to the shore here? Spike pointed to where he stood, which was the shortest distance to the shore from where we confronted them. Makore's reply was laughable, because his house was on that side. With that, a policeman suggested we go and see the blood. Spike and I both looked at each other, concerned they'd smeared fish blood on one of the trees during their investigations. I also asked the head policeman why he wasn't taking notes. He had a pen and paper in hand, but wasn't writing anything. He said he'd report what he'd heard to his superiors. Upon reaching the tree line, approximately 140 meters across the bay, a policeman asked Makore to show us the tree with blood on it. He pointed one out, and I drove up close for Spike to hold on to it. Cutting the motor, I inspected the tree. It was about ten centimeters in diameter, with a few old broken branches, and a maximum of one and a half meters sticking out of the water. I looked carefully at every inch of the tree, and saw nothing at all. Are you sure this is the tree, Makore? I asked. There was blood on that tree this morning, he insisted. I glanced at Spike, and we both shook our heads as I asked all the policemen to inspect the tree, which they did in turn and found nothing. The head policeman seemed to look sceptical. He then suggested with a smile and a shake of his head that we return to camp, and he would inform his superiors. After arriving at camp, I asked all the policemen to inspect the boats. Mine was made from white fiberglass, and Mekis was constructed from rusted steel plate with sharp edges, which would almost certainly have left a mark on impact. They all inspected both boats and found no signs of any collision. In camp, the policemen, after being offered tea, asked for beers and fishing tackle. They informed us that the sub-aqua unit would, following procedure, be arriving any day to search for a body. After two beers and a handful of tackle each, they asked when we were leaving camp. I explained we would be leaving in three days, on Friday, and they asked that we call in at Siakobvu police station on our way out, as Subaqua would have done their search by then. We happily agreed, and they left. Chapter 6 Arrest the remainder of the trip was bliss, and we were all sorry to leave on Friday morning. After a two-hour drive, we arrived at Siakobvu police station. It was a bleak facility, just a simple rectangular building, cement brick under a corrugated iron roof in a fenced dirt yard about the size of a tennis court. Not the sort of place you wanted to spend too long in. In days gone by, it had been a punishment station for badly behaved police officers. Alongside the building was a small two-metre square hut, constructed entirely of corrugated iron with no windows. There were no trees in the yard, and temperatures were again in the 40 degrees Celsius range most of the day. We all walked up towards the entrance of the building, which had a small veranda. As we approached, I heard words over the two-way radio that will forever remain painfully clear to me. 
Have you detained those two white men yet? This is clearly a murder case, the voice said. Spike and I stared at each other in shock. I saw the blood drain from his face and felt my stomach churn. Who is Russell? snarled a policeman without any introductions or greetings. I am Russell, officer, I answered, raising my right hand. Remove your shoes. Who were you with when you murdered Mudimba? He spat the words at me. I was with Russell, said Spike, moving slightly closer. Remove your shoes. Arrest these two. The rest of you can go. He motioned to another officer to take hold of us and then told our friends to leave. Brebs, visibly shaken, asked, So what are you going to do with them? Can we leave some food or anything with them? No, you can call their lawyers. They'll know what to do, the policeman barked. The way he was acting, I knew we were in big trouble. We could all see that this man had a deep hatred for us. We were only allowed a few essential toiletries, a toothbrush, toothpaste, and my allergy tablets, and were escorted to the corrugated iron hut in the blazing sun. It was like an oven, and it stank. As we were sweltering in the heat, a pleasant young investigating officer, I.O., named Chabalala, called us one at a time for statements. Neither Spike nor I had ever had to write a statement before, and we were a little overwhelmed and confused. I asked Chabalala what I should write, as it was a long story and there wasn't much space on the form. He told me only to write that I denied all charges, which I did, and advised Spike to do the same. That night, temperatures hardly dropped. We sweated profusely and were attacked by swarms of mosquitoes. We slept on a hard dirt floor that smelled of urine on blankets that reeked of vomit. Sudza and boiled cabbage was our dinner, which we hardly touched. They provided no lunch. Around midday the following day, Sue and her dad, Steve, arrived with some food, which we were delighted to see. Sue had notified my lawyer, who would be flown to Binga on Monday morning, to prepare our bail application. She was distressed and agitated about our welfare, but strong during our meeting. The nasty individual who had ordered our arrest was thankfully off duty that weekend, and Chabalala allowed Sue and Steve to stay an hour, which we dearly appreciated. For accommodation, the McBean family very kindly offered Sue and Steve their lovely holiday home in Binga for as long as they needed. Being two hours away from the prison, it was as close to us as they could hope to be. Later that day, Mike Shaw and Mike Taylor arrived to inform us that the sub aqua unit had searched for the body that morning, but had only found my cap. We were very appreciative of their concern and effort. They had driven four hours on bad roads to check on us and keep us informed. That Saturday night was another stinking nightmare. A filthy, drunk man was thrown in with us, making it even more unpleasant. The next day, at around 3 p.m., Spike and I were handcuffed and transferred in the back of a small, rattling old pickup to Binga police holding cells two hours away. It was a rough ride. We were jam-packed in the back with other passengers and their goods and arrived filthy, tired, and demoralized. But it was about to get even worse. Chapter 7 Binga Police Station The reception at Binga Police Station was probably the most hostile event I had ever experienced. The police attacked us one at a time with vicious verbal abuse, leaving us very shaken by the racial undertones. Mercifully, thirty minutes later, Sue and Steve arrived, and we were permitted to talk to them for twenty precious minutes. That night, Sue was permitted to bring us food, which was a godsend. Gerald Oosthuizen, bless him, had offered to provide us with free food daily from his shop in Binga for as long as we needed it. The support from all these people was genuinely heartwarming and uplifting. That night in Binga police holding cells was probably the worst of my life. We were packed in a cell, and throughout the night more drunks were thrown in almost every hour. 
We lay on a filthy concrete floor using blankets that were caked with vomit and feces. It was steaming hot, and again the mosquitoes were impossibly bad. I could not have slept more than an hour that night. When morning finally came, we were allowed a five-minute wash under a low garden tap in the centre of the courtyard, in full view of everyone. That mattered little. It was badly needed, and I felt great for being a little cleaner. Soon Spike was escorted by three plain-clothed men alone to a room. I was not at all comfortable about it. Some twenty minutes later, my lawyer, Mark Mellon, arrived with Sue and Steve. I had immense faith in Mark, with long, straight black hair and a very long, unmanaged black beard. He looked like a shepherd, but he was bright, thorough, and sincere, and I was pinning our hopes on him. My immediate concern was that they were going to beat Spike. As soon as I told Mark that they had taken Spike away, he demanded to be taken directly to his client. We followed a policeman to a room and found Spike, without shoes, sitting in the center of a room, being bombarded with questions by the three plainclothes men. Mark walked in, and they released Spike right away. Mark took until 3 p.m. to complete the bail application. We were escorted to court, and the magistrate then said he needed to consider it overnight. We were transferred to Binga Remand Prison. It was spotless, and the guards were very decent and helpful. All I could think was, when is this nightmare going to end? Little did I know, it was only just beginning. Chapter 8. Lynch Mob The night went relatively well. There were about 40 of us in a 5 by 5 meter cell with inadequate ventilation, but thankfully there were no mosquitoes, which enabled our first decent sleep in four days. What I battled with was that we were not permitted to walk upright at all, day or night. We had to hunch over to stay below the height of a guard's eye level. This was traditionally a sign of subservience, making us look up to our superiors. When speaking to a guard, always, we had to go down on our knees or crouch very low. Water was abundant, and there was no limit on showering, which in the heat felt beautiful. The problem was that the toilet, open for all to see, was beside the shower. Accustomed to privacy, it was tough trying to relax, squatting over a hole in a cement block with all eyes on me. Far from being polite and looking away, the other inmates stared shamelessly. When sitting in the courtyard, we could see through the two security fences. Watching the civilian activity with people going about their daily lives made us desperate to be free again. We were locked up from 3 p.m. and 7 a.m., and no food was permitted in cells. There were only blankets, a dustbin full of water with a lid placed on top of it, and a plastic cup on top of the lid. We took a cup full of water, drank what we needed, and if we didn't finish what was in the cup, it went into the toilet, not back in the bin. I made the mistake of doing that and was reprimanded. The toilet was a stainless steel round bowl, sunk into a one-meter square concrete block with nothing around it. When we urinated, we had to stand with one leg on the floor and cock the other on the block, like a dog, and pee directly into the bowl so there was no spillage. A number two was only in an emergency, and then we had to cover ourselves with a blanket to hide and try to stifle the smell. During the night, the inmates would talk and play cards until 8 p.m. latest. After that, all interaction was forbidden as was smoking in the cells, thank goodness. Going to court on Tuesday morning was extremely humiliating. It was the first time I had ever been in leg irons and handcuffed in public. Spike's mom and dad had driven down to attend the hearing, and I recall being extremely emotional in front of Chris. Since he'd been a close friend of my father, I had known him for as long as I could remember. The feeling of helplessness in front of someone I had looked up to my whole life was too much. Mark spoke very well, but we were told that as the charge was murder, 
only a high court judge could grant bail. My heart dropped. The magistrate ordered us to be remanded in custody pending an application to the high court. Mark requested we be transferred to Bulawayo pending this appeal, but this was denied. We were to stay in Binga remand prison. Mark moved fast, and a bail application was submitted the following day in Bulawayo, and our hearing was set down for Friday at 2 p.m. Sue and Steve visited daily, bringing us food from Gerald's shop and news of progress. While trying to relax on the concrete courtyard floor on Wednesday around midday, I heard unfamiliar chanting in the distance and went to have a closer look. As it approached, initially we could only see a banner, then a mass of demonstrators and press photographers snapping away. The banner read, Whites kill black, they must hang. My heart missed a beat and my stomach churned in shock as I looked at this. They turned in unison, their chants growing louder as about two hundred angry people strode determinedly towards the prison. The guards quickly ushered us into our cells and locked the doors. The following day, our names were all over the news. In the eyes of the media, we were already guilty of killing an innocent man who was merely trying to catch a few fish. Late on Thursday morning, three police officers visited us. One was Inspector Zulu from Binga Police Station. They sat us down in a private room across a table from them, pen and pads in hand, and asked us to tell them what happened. In retrospect, what followed was one of the biggest mistakes I have ever made. In a cocky manner, I told the inspector that we were not prepared to say anything without our lawyer present. In hindsight, he was considering our side of the story for the first time, and a more helpful approach from me may have led them to changing their horribly distorted docket. He left, clearly annoyed. Later that day, two plain-clothed intelligence officers arrived, asking us about our family history, going back as far as our parents' birth. Having by then realized my error with the inspector, we told them all. On Friday, our hearing in Bulawayo took place, and we were granted bail. However, we could only be released in Binga, 420 kilometers away, with the original warrant of liberation from the court. The warrant was issued around 3 p.m., and Sue and Steve waited until then to feed us and bring us the welcome news. The OIC, officer in charge at the prison, was very kind and understanding. He arranged for someone to take the original bail docket to the Bulawayo police station, and they faxed a copy to Binga police station, which then verified it. Once the OIC received a copy at around 6 p.m., he released us, on condition that we would have someone deliver the original the next day. Everything went according to plan, and we all left for home, very relieved on Saturday morning. My bail conditions were to report to Hillside Police Station in Bulawayo twice a week. Spike was to report to Mvuma Police Station, close to where he lived, 320 kilometers from Bulawayo. I was relieved to be home and have a chance to gather my thoughts while trying to get my life back on track. Chapter 9 Wheels Within Wheels Roughly three months after the incident, a man named A.J. Rose, a private investigator who was one of the many individuals offering help to have the case expedited, convinced me that he could have the docket sent to Bulawayo within a month. He was confident the courts would throw it out for lack of evidence. At the time, the case was national news and a topic of discussion all over the country, A.J. owed me quite a lot of money from a previous joint venture, but I liked him and in a sense trusted him to be fair with me. He claimed he knew all the policemen in the Binga area. All he asked for at that time was a vehicle and money for expenses. He struck me as credible and I agreed. In Zimbabwe, as in most African countries, the law is seldom applied conventionally. In most cases, other factors come into play, and the key is who knows who, 
and can pull the right strings. I thought this chap could do that. I didn't know then, but this decision was another grave mistake. Upon arriving in Binga with my land cruiser, AJ was told by the OIC that the docket was still being finalized at Siakobvu police station. The OIC at Siakobvu, who had been so hard on us, happened to be an old friend of AJ's and assured him the docket would be complete within a month. AJ returned to Bulawayo, kept in touch on the landline phone with the OIC and drove out again after a month to transfer the docket, together with a policeman, to Binga. Unbeknown to me, by now he was stepping on toes and upsetting a few people. The OIC in Binga advised him that the docket would be forwarded to the officer commanding, OC, in Huanga that week. AJ knew the OC in Huanga who informed him after a month that the docket had not arrived there yet. My vehicle left again for Binga, costing me more fuel and money. I started to think AJ was enjoying these sojourns at my expense and made my frustrations known. AJ said he now wanted the money he owed me to be written off because the issue was far more complicated than he anticipated. I was angry, but in a jam. I agreed. It got worse. The OIC in Binga sent the docket back to Siakobvu. The I.O. there was changed and all affidavits were redone. The new I.O.'s name was Philip, and he seemed very pleasant. During this period, we did indications with the police at the scene of the incident, and Philip did the reports. My lawyer had gone to extreme measures for us to attend indications with the witnesses. He had obtained an order from the High Court allowing Spike and I to travel to the area, as it was against our bail conditions, and he liaised with Binga police for the witnesses to be present. Mark, Spike and I drove out to the camp and met Philip and other policemen there. They had come by boat from Binga, but amazingly no state witnesses were present, as was prearranged. The police in Binga had assured Mark that they would be attending. During indications, after we had shown Philip precisely what happened, he asked me a question that threw me. Where were you when you were pulled out of your boat into the water? Spike and I stared hard at him, incredulously, and I said, Who was pulled into the water? Realizing he'd said the wrong thing, he looked down without answering the question. I pressed him. Who pulled who into the water, Philip? Mekki said he got into a fight with you both and pulled you both out of your boat into the water, he mumbled quietly. Spike and I were both astounded and started laughing. I can't believe this. Are you serious, Philip? Did Mekki say that? I asked. He and the other officer were now laughing too, but he wouldn't say any more. We left it at that. Months later, after bail conditions had been relaxed, I was in Binga Quick Spa supermarket and saw Philip. I asked for an opinion on how long it was going to be before the docket would be completed. He mentioned that he had been taken off the case and another I.O. appointed, which left me shocked. Stick to your story and all should be okay, he said. Although he was relaxed and appeared to empathize with us, I had nagging doubts. Taking it all into account, I realized...